Most people are just awesome. Oh, yeah, man. Like, and yeah. they're having a blast, mm -hmm. and you get to share it with them. Yeah, that's one of the things that is the, like, one of the super fun parts, and we were just talking about this, was you get to go hang out with some of these people for five days, and you have a blast. Like, you show up as uh, probably, like, never meeting them, usually, you know, usually when they're showing up at my place. Um, I've talked to them on the phone, maybe even just through email, depending on, you know, how they like to communicate. And, uh, you know, you show up as, they show up as strangers and you leave as friends. You know, I've had two clients just call me this morning just to BS, like just because they're buddies now, you know? Yeah. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. We're back with <laughs> the third part of the series on Kodiak Island. And I have with me again... Jordan Budd. Yes. And today, mm -hmm. Jordan and I are going to talk about guiding and hunting and kind of tease out some of the differences between the two. Okay. Man, guiding isn't what I thought it was before I started guiding. Mm -hmm. My stepdad, uh, he guided in way north in the Yukon. He guided in Wyoming and Montana and as a little kid, I just idolized him. And in my mind, guides were the people who were the absolute best hunters and fishermen that were out there. And it was very clear to me that it was a good thing to be the best at something. Mm -hmm. The reality is guides aren't necessarily the best hunters. Right. And skill in hunting doesn't necessarily translate to skill in guiding. Because the skill sets are wildly different. Would you agree with that? Yes. I think so. Um, I think if somebody wants to be a guide, one of the first things they've got to realize, I guess, is we're out there hunting a lot, but there's a, there's a lot more going on than just the hunting aspect of it. Um, what else is going on? So you've got uh, your meals to think about and the logistics on that whole thing so when you get back to the especially like if you're doing we do a lot of the meals on our own um like the guides like i'm cooking basically so if you can get it structured to where like dinner is ready before like when when you get home at night so then you're not you don't get back and then the guys aren't eating at like 11 o'clock at night um but that all takes, like, that's just one example, but that all takes a lot of thought that people don't realize, I think. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of guides, and this is true, and I've seen it in all kinds of guiding, they're like, I'm just not really into cooking. I'm really not into doing dishes. Like, yeah, well, okay. It's part of the gig. You wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. So what are some other things that a guide has to do besides, you know, walk through a dewy meadow and point to a bugling elk on the edge of the timber and say shoot him uh you need to be you have to be able to read people and pick people's spirits up a lot mm -hmm. and be able to like not everybody's the same not every hunter's the same so you have to be able to adapt to like how a person is going to react or how a person might learn better than another person so um, if that makes sense, yeah, you have to be able to, like, really communicate well <laughs> and in different ways, I think. Yeah, and with all kinds of people. Yeah. All kinds of people. And all different kinds of skill sets. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that that I often do for clients is I will research a little bit about them ahead of time. And figure out what their hobbies are, what their interests are, what their profession is. And then I'll look at 
that profession or hobby and start to figure out some of the words that are specific to it, what that vernacular is. And then if I'm trying to teach them something, then I'll use the words that come from that profession or hobby. So if I'm working on somebody on their fly fly fishing cast and they're struggling with it, and I know that they're a golfer, I might try and pull up some golf terminology. And that sort of gives them a solid foundation to stand on and and a comfortable space because they're like, oh, I've golfed a lot. I'm good at that. Um, I understand what he's saying. I I can apply the same principle. Mm -hmm. And you can usually find something. And even if it's a little bit of a stretch, it tends to settle people down and and put them in a head space that's a little bit better for moving forward and progressing. So teaching is is a huge part of guiding. Yeah. And, you know, I, I say that I'm always willing to learn, but I'm not always willing to be taught. <laughs> and it's it's the absolute truth. So you also have to be able to understand, like, when you just need to back off. And sometimes people would rather sit there and struggle on their own than have somebody explain to them, you know, the way to, to fix the problem. Yeah. It can be interesting because... You know, you'll be used to say there's like a big deer. I've been in this situation a couple of times in the, you know, you need to really hustle. We needed to hustle to get on the ridge. Like right now it needs to be going down. And, you know, I got up there and the client was still back a ways coming, you know, as fast as he could. Um, but that's a, that's some time where like you cannot get worked up like, Hey, we got to go do this like now or you're going to, you can't. You have to be very, uh, gentle is not really the right word, but basically you have to be kind of gentle with, um, how you react to something like that or how you motivate them to get up the hill or whatever. Cause if you're like all frazzled, like, Hey, you need to be up here now and you know, like go shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. It's going to be a, it could be a bad situation. Russian people. I think the tarpon fishing guides have got to be some of the worst. Because my clients that come and fish with me after they've been tarpon fishing in Florida, they're they're really tense up and they're they're nervous. And I've had multiples of them be like, "Wow, you're not yelling at me." It's like, "No, I'm not yelling. We're, we're fly fishing. <laughs> yeah, like we're 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 trolling in the lake. Like this is relaxing. It's peaceful. <laughs> we're happy. We're having mm-hmm. fun. Why would I yell at you? Because you missed a fish. Oh well, we're not trying yeah. to feed feed ourselves. Like it's gonna be okay." So I think that kind of goes into a really important guiding principle for me. And that is that I help people achieve success the way they define it. I like that. And I start in the parking lot. So I now will ask people, like, how do you define success today? And if the way they define success is unreasonable and unachievable, I can squash that right there and bring them back to reality. So if they show up, on the sixth ranch and they want to go fly fishing. I'm like, Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I'm James. <laughs> how, how do you define success today? What are you looking for? Some people will be like, you know, I just really want to work on my roll cast. I'm like, Oh, awesome. I would have spent all day trying to catch fish mm-hmm. and you just want to learn how to do a cast. I can help with that. If somebody's like, I'm looking for a 28 inch rainbow trout. I'm like, well, sir, I don't got none of them, <laughs> you know, yeah. wish I did, but here's the reality of, of what's available here. We can try and go out and catch the biggest fish that we can. Um, that is going to involve sacrificing, catching as many fish, you know, you, you talk through it and, you know, bring them back down to back down to earth. And then now that they have the information to reengage. So knowing what you know now, how do you define success today? And they'll be like, well, I just want to catch the biggest fish out here. Cool. I can drive everything that I'm doing towards helping you achieve that. And the same thing with with the archery. And, you know, I really took a humble pill this year. And a guy that has hunted with me for several years, you know, I, I was starting to realize that he was really interested in the experience and in traveling lots of miles, calling a lot, seeing a lot of elk. Um, and he was less concerned with actually bringing meat home. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't necessarily want to kill a bull. He would have, if the opportunity was there and it was just perfect and exactly what he wanted, but it wasn't really his goal. 
And, you know, it's hard for me because that's very different from what my goal would be if I was in, in his situation, but I'm not, I'm in my situation. Mm-hmm. He's in his situation. And my situation is one where I'm trying to help him be successful. And he had a great time. This was his best hunt ever. And he told me so. And he, I don't know if he ever even drew his bow. Um, he That's saw cool. a lot of elk. He traveled a lot of miles. He had a great time. But yeah, so it's it's just different, you know? Yeah. I think uh, I really try to not vet them ahead of time, but give them very realistic expectations. Mm-hmm. But I need to start asking more of like, what do you want on this hunt? So last year I had a guy that came mule deer hunting and uh, we glassed this buck up. It's like a three by three bedded on the hill. And I saw him from a long ways away and we put the spotter on him, whatever. And I'm like, man, you know, I think we could do better. Like we could look for a four by four. Like we could, we'll be able to find a better deer for you, I think. And, and he's like, uh, I kind of want to make that stock. Like, I kind of want to go, I want to try to shoot him. I'm like, okay. So we go up and it was like a six hour ordeal. Um, but we got within 30 yards and I cow called and made the deer stand up and he shot him. And the dude was like over the moon, excited about it. And he's like, I've been trying to, to kill a buck for, it was like 10 years or something like that. And, uh, and he's like, this is like my first buck I've ever killed with a bow. And so it was just, it was one of those things where I just assumed since it was a three by three, he wouldn't want it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I don't mean, that's just one of those things. Um, cause then you get, uh, you know, you get some guys on the other end of the spectrum too, that, you know, I've never seen a mule deer before maybe. And you'll roll out and you'll see, I like glass this mule deer up. And this gentleman just, like, didn't even look at it. Just asked me how big it was, inch w- inches-wise. He'd never seen a mule deer before. So you get people, like, on totally different ends of the the spectrum. That communication thing is big because, I mean, those guys are spending a lot of their hard-earned money that, who knows, like, that could be their only trip that they're going to go on. And, you know, once every two years, three years, four years, whatever. So you want to give them, like, the most realistic expectations that you can for your hunt so they're not going into something thinking it was a a super good, you know, like a cheap mule deer hunt and they're going to get to shoot at like a 180, right. you know. I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately. And if I were to break it down into what I enjoy the most and enjoy the least about guiding, the answer is the same. And it is the clients. So truly what I enjoy the most about guiding are the clients that I get to guide and the people that I get to meet. And most of them are wonderful. Yeah. And they, whether they're, whether, whether they're affluent and business owners, you know, from a very diverse field, everybody's an expert in something mm-hmm. and you get to hang out with them for, mm-hmm. you know, hours or days and learn about their lives and you know, what, what makes them tick and how they got to where they were. Or maybe, you know, they're not very affluent and they they saved and scraped up that money for a long time. And this was a goal that they worked towards to achieve. And even if it's a half-day fishing trip, it's still, you know, it's a significant amount of money to, mm-hmm. to spend. And I have a lot of respect for that because as a kid, you know, I thought that it was something that was unachievable to ever, like, be guided, to go on a guided hunt. Yeah. And then I changed that mindset to, to working towards that so that I could do both so that I could be a guide so that I could hunt on my own and go on, on hunts that required a guide. And there's something very special in each of those. Now, the other side of the coin is that sometimes the clients are the worst thing about guiding and clients, friends, everybody kind of wants to hear those stories. Like they want to hear about the nightmares yeah, and, and the train wrecks. And it's not necessarily a professional thing to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, there can be lessons learned. And I think that guides can, can talk about that and be like, Hey, you know, this had this client, this is a situation. This is how, you know, went wrong and what I learned from it. And maybe you can take that away and, and not have those same problems yourself. But it also doesn't 
too good to like drag anybody down or talk about their failures in the field. Yeah. Even if it's really frustrating for you personally. Yeah. Yep. I think that, uh, yeah, that's right. Everybody wants to hear about the, the bad ones or the, not even really the bad ones, just like the things that happen might even not have been a bad person, you know, it's right. just things that happen. And, uh, I don't know, like stuff happens and, you know, I, I get frustrated and, and I need to air that stuff out with somebody. But when I do, you know, I'm, I'm calling you yeah, or, you know, calling one of my close friends and like, man, just venting about this it. just happened. Yeah. Like, I want to talk <laughs> about it and, you know, blow it out there and be like, has anything like that ever happened to you? Like, no, that was pretty weird. Mm-hmm. Sure enough. And, and then you move on, yeah. um, learn what you can from it. And, and, and that's that. But truly, the majority of the people that I've guided in in all walks of, of guiding, you know, everything from backcountry horse trips to whitewater trips to fly fishing and hunting and, you know, everything. Most people are just awesome. Oh, yeah, man. Like, And yeah. they're having a blast. Mm-hmm. And you get to share it with them. Yeah, that's one of the things that is the, like, one of the super fun parts. And we were just talking about this was you get to go hang out with some of these people for five days and you have a blast. Like you show up as, uh, probably like never meeting them. Usually, you know, usually when they're showing up at my place, um, I've talked to them on the phone, maybe even just through email, depending on, you know, how they like to communicate. And, uh, you know, you show up as, they show up as strangers and you leave as friends you know, I've had two clients just call me this morning just to BS, like just because they're buddies now, you know? Yeah. So like that's one of the really fun parts about it is for five days, whether you're doing spot and stock or just hanging out with them like in the evenings after you pick them up from the stand or whatever, like you you crack jokes and you hear about all, you know, their stories. And and uh, that's like a really fun part of it is the, com- the camaraderie. Yeah, it is fun. I'm not a solo hunter. And I've had to do it more than I want to. I know? love it. You love it? <laughs> I do not. Um, you know, I I don't have the drive to just to, to keep going. Um, if there's not a lot of action, then I'll be like, you know what? I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. I want to share this with somebody. Like, I want, I want my buddies there. You know, I like hanging out with my friends. And if we can go hunting together and, and be excited together, that's awesome. And it's awesome if you're doing that with a client that you enjoy being around as well. But Yeah, they're just different. I think like the the solo all the time would get old. Yeah. But it's just like a different experience. It's pretty pretty cool. I like it. Yeah. And there's a there's a time and a place for it and, and that achievement you can you can really hang your hat on. Yeah. I would caution people who um who kinda wanna make that their identity. Like I am a hashtag solo mm-hmm. hunter or whatever. <laughs> like don't mm-hmm. don't do that because you might come up against a time when you hashtag want to hang out with somebody, <laughs> but you're a hashtag solo hunter. <laughs> you know, and those hashtags don't clash. <laughs> they don't work. Together. Oh man, that's funny. But no, the camaraderie is super fun. We were just talking about the filming aspect of it too. Yeah. Um, that I get to do is. And that's, that's like a really cool part of it. And it's funny, like we were kind of talking about it last night. Uh, the filming thing, it's funny the different perspectives that you'll get from people, you know. Um, I I think one of the reasons that I really like guiding is because I do really like helping people, you know, achieve their goal or whatever, whatever they're out to do. Um, I like helping people do that. And then on the filming side, I like helping people capture that to be able to look on or look back on, you know, when they get older or whatever. So the different perspectives can be interesting. Um, You know, I, uh, there's some people who asked me what I was gonna, like what my schedule was like this year. And so I, I listed some of them off, you know, they were like the Idaho bighorn hunt, which was a governor's tag. Um, Got to go on that. Um, Did like a Manti Utah hunt. Um, or a Utah elk hunt in the Manai, which is a really hard tag to draw. Um, and then I did a, a Wyoming high country mule deer hunt that was pretty cool. And then I was like doing this one with you guys. And, you know, it was funny. Some of the reactions I got were, um, 
oh, that sucks, you don't get to shoot anything. Like, well, but I get to go and experience it, and it's yeah, and unreal, dude. Actually get to shoot everything. Yeah, just with a camera. With a camera. With the old record button. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and what you're doing is invaluable, you know, to be able to to capture that memory, capture some of those feelings, and do it in a format that you can share it with other people. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Mm-hmm. I don't have that skill. It's super fun. And then I get to go hang out with you guys and cut it up on the mountain. Yeah. And just talk trash while we're glassing. Talk about children's books that James is going to write. It's my favorite. I am going to write a, a children's book series <laughs> at some point, and uh, it'll 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 be a bit rugged, you know. There yeah. might be an age limit. Yeah, I'm not going to want to read it to your two year old. Yeah, but uh, they're going to be good. Yeah, yeah, great illustrations. Good lessons in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. Yeah, so you know, Jordan and uh, and me, we we recorded another version of this podcast last night that took four and a half hours <laughs> but you know just due to the circumstances uh that the audio just didn't work out yeah right so it's kind of it's kind of funny because we've just like done this big hours long rehearsal and then distilled everything that we talked about down into a few minutes and realistically we can talk about guiding forever mm-hmm. but you don't necessarily need to like it's an interesting job. It's almost like you're a matchmaker, like a really creepy matchmaker. <laughs> like, hey, I'd like to introduce you to this white-tailed deer. Would you like him to live inside your living room forever? <laughs> Would you like to eat this yeah. animal? I will help yeah, you do that. I can arrange this type of meeting. <laughs> and uh, no, it's it's fun. It's it's yeah. fun. It's fun to learn and 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 share these experiences. It's very hard work. Yeah. It's a year long thing. It can get you tired. It's long, long yeah. hours. <laughs> <laughs> it can get you tired. Yeah. I mean, you roll through a month of, you know, 16, 18, 20 hour days. Like, you'll get goofy. Yeah. Yeah. I just think there's, there's, there can be some misconceptions about just guides in general. Oh, um, totally. Yeah. It's like we don't, we don't just roll out and hunt all, like, we hunt, but it's we're professional doing it. We kind of talked about on the, the at the beginning. There's more to it than just rolling out and just shooting something yeah. all the time. And I think we all have to. Uh, we all have our reasons that we like doing it. I really like helping people do get you know get whatever they're after or whatever their goal is. But I think that carries over too, even on like on the gear review stuff and then, um, writing articles and, and talking to people that way. Cause a lot of these guys, um, you know, they saved up a lot of money over a lot of time and a lot of, um, vacation time, especially to come out and they might have 10 days that they can come out and do whatever. And whether that's guiding or helping them with their gear stuff, like I want to make sure that they get the you know, most bang for their buck, if you will, on those 10 days, because that's all they're going to get. And they've been looking forward to it forever. So if you, they could have a a gear failure and it might screw their entire hunt up or it's going to screw three, four days of like the best time to hunt or whatever. So, yeah, like, I mean, I know you like helping people do do this, I think. I do. I love it. Um, and the more engaged they want to be, the the more I want to work for them. Mm-hmm. And I will I will outwork every client. I promise that, like substantially. And that means that the more they put into it, the more I put into it. And I I feed off that. I love that energy. Mm-hmm. And if they want to put nothing into it, sometimes I'll put just enough. And, uh, and that's, that's really, really draining. It's physically, emotionally, mentally draining with somebody just, you know, all they want to do is pull the trigger and you you lose creativity and you can kind of lose sight of, of why you're there. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting that different, uh, yeah, the different people with the different skill sets is fun. Like I just, I had a antelope client this year. I guided that 
he was hunting with a stick bow. And he's like, you know, I'm, I kind of just want you to help me, like, you know, find the animal, help me with the transportation stuff, get close, and then I'll go, f- you know, make the final stock. Which was super cool because I got to sit back and, like, watch, you know, and just kind of let him do his thing, which was fun. And then you've got guys that have really never stocked before. So then you're with them every step of the way and and helping them, like, literally with everything, with, you know, the ranging and, and everything. And uh, yeah, it's just cool. You can help different people with different skill sets do different things, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Still be a part of it, work together. That's one thing, too. Um, you know, we aren't just out barking orders. Well, I'm, I'm not anyways. I don't think you are either. It's more of like you're hunting together. You're helping each other um, because it it does, you know, really help when the client helps a guide spot or something like that or can catch something because we're all human. So, yeah. 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 And, you know, I've, I've guided guys that are better than me, substantially better than me. And while I might be the expert for that location, you know, they are far more expertise with that species or with that tactic, that hunting style. Maybe they've been doing it for 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're still going to look at you and be like, hey, what's the plan? But you need to look back at them with humility and be like, this is what I think we should do. This is what I know about the situation. I'm also interested in your input and what you think, because I'd love to learn from you. I'd like to get better at this. Yeah. And you've got some knowledge that I could benefit from. And I don't know anybody that doesn't respond well to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, folks, guiding, hunting, it's what we do. We like it. We're not stopping. (laughs) We ain't stopping. (laughs) (laughs) Anytime soon. There is a little... uh, I don't know, what's, what's that move called when your head, like, stays level and goes back and forth? That's what Jordan was just doing. You said something last night that was awesome. The Z-snap. The Z-snap. The Z-snap. Yeah, he usually comes with a Z-snap. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. usually comes with a Z-snap. So, with the Z-snap, we ain't stopping. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. This episode was edited by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Artwork for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatterlin and digitized by Celia Christofferson. If you enjoyed the show, I encourage you to share it with a friend and subscribe. You can find photos and more content on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.